Hello Model Builders and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. This is going to be a special episode as I take on my first commission build for a client. Commission build has been something I've kind of steered clear of a little bit because I felt that if I was going to start getting paid to build models, it would start to feel a little bit more like work and I might not have the same vested interests as I would when I was choosing my own model to work on. Although this had loosely been my stance on doing commission builds, I had a gentleman named Peter contact me and asked if I would build the same aircraft that his great uncle had been flying in North Africa. His first email stated that his uncle had been flying the Hawker Hurricane and that was the kit he wanted me to build. And having built the Airfix Hurricane and knowing some of the pitfalls of that kit, I decided that I would finally do a commission build just to test the waters. But there was a slight issue because when Peter sent me the first picture of his great uncle, the canopy didn't look like a Hawker Hurricane. It was a lot bigger, a lot wider and taller, and looked more like a Kitty Hawk, which the Royal Air Force was flying in North Africa at the time. Peter was able to give me some more information when he told me that his great uncle was killed in action on May 10th, 1942, and that he'd been flying for 250 Squadron. But now a wrench had been thrown into the mix because 250 Squadron was transitioning between a Hawker Hurricanes and the Kitty Hawks at the time. Being a big history buff, I was very excited to start digging into this and finding out as much information as I could. Armed with the pilot's name, Pilot Officer Tweedy, and the date he was killed in action, I started digging through the internet and contacting some sources. The Bomber Command Museum of Nanton, I contacted the National Archives in England, and I also contacted the Royal Air Force through email asking some questions. And about a month into digging, I was actually contacted by the National Archives in England who were able to tell me that not only was Pilot Officer Tweedy flying a Kitty Hawk when he was lost in action, we actually had the registration of the aircraft as well, AL-111. I quickly emailed Peter back, let him know the source and the information I had, and asked him if he wanted me to move forward and start building the Kitty Hawk, and he said yes. Luckily, when it comes to picking a kit of a Kitty Hawk to build in 148 scale, there's really only one provider and that's Hasegawa. Now, I couldn't find the specific Kitty Hawk model kit, but that's basically a P-40E that's been put on lease to the British. And if you've ever seen the Hasegawa P-40, it's a very beautiful kit, lots of detail, and there's not much you can do inside for scratch building, but we did pick up the Edward kit just to add a few more goodies into the pit and make it look a little more busy. The next challenge I ran into was finding the proper interior color for an RAF Len Lease Kitty Hawk. The problem being, Curtis changed their aircraft interior color several times during the war, and depending on what point that aircraft was produced, it could be upwards of four different colors. But luckily, the RAF likes to be a little more specific in details, and searching through some forums and contacts, I found some sources that stated that the Kitty Hawks loaned to the RAF were painted the interior gray-green, the standard one that the Spitfires and Hurricanes were using. But if I decided to do a Tomahawk, the earlier variant, it would have been a toss-up between the gray-green or the Curtis interior green, so luckily having the registration number gave me a little more detail for the clarity I was looking for. Being that AL-333 was only in service for a few months before being lost in combat, I decided not to go full tilt weathering this aircraft. It had only been in service with this squadron for two months after leaving the factory, so I avoided the normal chipping, dents and dings and weathering I would normally do. I did add some dust into the cockpit just to make it look more lived in. However, it wasn't going to be nearly the same level as weathering as the Spitfire I recently did. Sharkmouths and P-40s go hand in hand, but surprisingly 250 was probably the only squadron in North Africa that hadn't painted the Sharkmouth on their aircraft. If you're wondering about the history behind the shark mouth, it initially started with the Germans who'd been painting them on their BF 110s and 109s. The British seeing this and noticing that the P-40 had a gigantic mouth copied it onto their Tomahawk aircraft in 1941. The American volunteer group flying in China at the time seen this in a magazine and loved it and started painting them on their own aircraft and in the end they said it looked mean as hell. One thing that Hasegawa has done with this mold that a lot of companies try to do is build it in sections so you can build different variants of aircraft without having to redo the entire mold. The problem with that is if certain parts don't plug in properly or they're a little bit offset, you can end up having quite a bit more work than you're expecting, and the P-40 is one of those kits. 
I've followed along on two scale ton builds where he's built the P40, the E, and the N, and both times he made it look to go together very easily. But that's the beauty of video editing. My experience with this kit is that it didn't go together that smoothly, and there was quite a bit of overlapping and underlapping, is that a word, of the wings, and the plugs themselves were quite the fight. And you'll see that here as I start to fill gaps with epoxy putty, sand it, hit it with primer, sand it some more before the seams were gone and the ghost seams were eliminated as well. That was not something I was really expecting with this kit and definitely took the wind out of my sails. I found that it was a lot more work than the Airfix Hurricane I just built a few weeks before. But in reality, that should have been the case because that Airfix Hurricane came out 10 years later. The P-40 was one of the few American aircraft that was in service before World War II and continued service throughout the conflict. Although it didn't serve over Europe, it did play a key role in China, North Africa, and in the Pacific theaters. And it was also flown by many nations including the French, Soviets, British, and Canadians. And Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, and British, much anybody else part of the British Commonwealth. Although the P-40 was pushed into the back stages of the history books compared to the P-51 Mustang, many pilots became aces in the P-40 and loved the aircraft as being very durable and very forgiving, along with quite a few pilots becoming aces. The Royal Canadian Air Force operated the Kitty Hawk throughout the war and used it in defense of their homeland. And in one of the stranger periods of the war, they used them to shoot down balloons that had been released by Japan to start forest fires in America. Another standout event for the P-40 was when 75 of them were launched off the aircraft carrier Ranger during Operation Torch in 1943. Here you can see one of the plugs in the rear of the aircraft that's part of making different variants from the production company. And unfortunately, if you get all the lines set properly, you still have some nasty gaps that have to be filled. The gun plugs, same story, there was about a mill on each side that had to be filled and cleaned up. So there was a lot of sanding on this model, and at this point it looks like a drywalling experiment. I was able to source a set of Edward flaps for this model just to make it look a little more interesting, although a lot of photos show the Kitty Hawk with the flaps retracted when it's parked and shut down. The nice thing about building models though is you can build them how you like, so we'll overlook that little fact for now. One thing I did notice when doing some research for this model build is that the P-40 isn't exactly an aircraft that has a lot of support from aftermarket companies other than Edward and some few photo etch parts and some ultra cast wheels and seats there really wasn't much to find when you compare it to something like the Spitfire where you can get all different variants of the rims guns brass whatever it's all out there so if you're an aftermarket company maybe consider giving the P40 some love or maybe even building a whole new kit because I'm sure people will buy it the newest one is still 15 years old. A lot of sanding and test fitting was completed before these flaps were ready to be glued in place. And just when I thought I avoided the worst, the top of the fuselage didn't want to go back into place with the flaps in place. So there was some more test fitting and sanding. And that's usually a hole you dig for yourself when you start using aftermarket and something you need to be prepared for. So that's not something to get to the kit. That's just something that you have to keep in mind if you're going to do these modifications. Just when I thought I had the seams all cleaned up and I was ready to move forward, I noticed that the wings didn't join the fuselage anywhere near a panel line. So not only do you have another seam line you need to fill, there's nothing there that positively locks it. It's just a butt joint. So if you put any pressure on at all, it pops the joint out of place and you have to re-glue it. So just keep that in mind as well too. Once I thought all the filling was done and sanding, I applied some black paint over the seams just to check. And that was a process that took two more attempts. Once all the sanding was done though, I cleaned everything up with some isopropyl rubbing alcohol to get all the grime, oils, and crap from my fingers off it and dust and have it ready for primer. I also had trouble getting the paint to stick to the flaps on my Hurricane, so I applied some Mr. Metal Primer this time just to see if I could avoid that type of finagle. And finally, with everything cleaned up, it was time to fire on the primer and unify everything. While the primer was drying, it was now time to find some blueprints for the P-40 so I could lay out some rivets and really add some detail to the aircraft. I know I've said it before in several videos, but I will say it again, and that is after my airbrush, my Rosie the Riveter tool is my favorite purchase for model building because 
You can take any kit, be it a $10 Airfix kit or a $60 Edward kit, and just add so much more detail and just have your kit look that much better. I do have a tutorial video in my playlist if this is something you're interested in or want some more details, and it'll walk you through from step one if you've never done this before or if it's something you want to learn a little bit more about. Everything from scaling the blueprints properly to how to actually mark the model is all there. Or you may be somebody that just prefers to experiment and keep trying different things until it works for you. Once all the rivets were laid in place on the aircraft, I removed the lines with sanding sponge and that helps me make sure that I don't miss anything and get all the rivets flush with the skin. It kind of sucks when you're laying down paint and notice that there's quite a few rivets that are still sticking up past the skin and don't look great at all. As I stated earlier, this aircraft was only in service for two months, so I didn't go too crazy with wear and tear in the paint. I only did a little bit of black basing, color basing, or as Duke's calling it, sandwich basing, sandwich shading, just to add some tonal differences to the paint. And this is just to keep it from looking flat and dull and almost toy-like. If I wanted this aircraft to look more worn or been in service for a few years, I would add some more blues, grays, browns, and yellows to the paint just to get a lot more variance going on and some more depth. The nice thing about working with very thin down paints as you're seeing here is you can slowly build up the layers until you're happy with how much of that toning is still showing through underneath. The more layers you add, the less weathering you'll have. That's the easiest way to explain it. My favorite method for getting a nice even demarcation line in camouflage is to just take a template of paper and put two-sided tape underneath just to give it a nice even space from the model. That way if you're spraying at it from 90 degrees, you get that nice soft line instead of hard edges or overspray or any other weird stuff going on. It's also exciting when you start pulling that template off and you get to see the aircraft coming together. One thing I had trouble sourcing the actual color for were the flap bays. Some sources were saying they were gray green, other ones were saying they were aircraft interior green, or they were the Curtis green. So with all these sources saying different things and nothing very definitive, I chose to reference the Vintage Wings of Canada P40 that they restored. They had the gray green inside the cockpit for the RAF, but they were also using the interior green in the flap base. So if you can't be sure, I like to go with the more interesting option. This is my second time now painting RAF roundels, and once again, I'm not entirely happy with the process I'm using. I think the easiest way to do this is to start with the markings of the aircraft and then lay the camouflage over top. I find that coming in after you've done the camouflage, it's a lot harder and it takes more layers to cover up the paint underneath, and you may end up with a little bit of buildup, but a little bit of sanding gets rid of that. But you don't learn unless you try new things. So I think the next time I do this, that'll be the method I try. The biggest attraction to painting markings on is one, that's what they do on the real aircraft. And two, you don't have to worry about silvering or decals that don't sit properly. You just fire on the paint and you're good to go. The only issue may be, as you'll see later, that you're not happy with the color you used overall and you have to come back and in touch it up. So don't delete any of your files. Make sure you save those in case you have to redo something. This was the crowning moment building this kit here, and that was when I put Pilot Officer Tweedy's registration number on the model of the aircraft he had been flying when he was killed in action. I know for me personally, by doing that, it was giving the model so much more meaning, and it was actually something that I knew a family was going to be able to hold on to and have a story to tell with it. After having that experience, maybe doing another commission build for the same reasons is something I'll look at down the road. Who knows? Now that all the markings have been painted on the aircraft and sealed under a clear coat, it was time to come in and do some post shading with some buff just to make it look a little weathered, a little sunbeat, but nothing too crazy. And the nice thing about using an acrylic paint on top of a lacquer gloss is if you don't like how something looks, you can come in with a little bit of water on a Q-tip, scrub it away, and start again. One thing I've started using a lot more of lately with my builds is oil paints. It's something I'm getting used to and trying to learn how to effectively use. But one thing I have noticed, especially with the Abilung paints, I probably said that wrong and I'm gonna get jumped on for the pronunciation. I found that with a little bit of odorless thinner, they're a lot easier to work with as a panel line wash than the Tamiya panel line washes. I find the Tamiya ones can be hard to remove and if they flow really nice, they don't actually stick. 
of the ebb tongue, or however you say it, paints sit nicely in the panel lines, and just by gently wiping it away, it stays in place, and it just blends beautifully. So it's something I'll have to experiment with more just to kind of get the hang of, but it's definitely something I'm glad I tried. One thing I've noticed when you're about to close out a model build and you're down to those last few details is there's definitely a case of get their itis in my head. And it's very hard to focus and put the same effort in those last small details as the entire plane. I, th I think the best way I can put it is that while I'm sitting here painting landing gear, which isn't that exciting, is in my head I'm already thinking of the next project, what I'm going to do, what colors I need, kind of like the squirrel moment because it's very easy to lose focus and that's not something you want to do with the small details because that's what can catch you out. Just to generate some discussion down here in the YouTube comments section, why don't you write what is your least favorite thing to do or what do you find the most challenging mentally about building a model kit? Maybe not working with oils or paints, but what do you find something that you have to physically push yourself through just to get it done? One thing I kept doing with this kit was knocking off my toothpick stands to keep the aircraft off the mat from getting a damage or anything like that. So I finally got fed up and decided to glue the wheels and the landing gear legs in place because this kit has very stout landing gear so you don't have to worry about knocking that off. And then it was on to weathering the bottom and the top with the last pass of dust and just trying to blend this in. Compared to this Spitfire again it's just some light weathering and nothing too crazy. Exhaust stacks and staining, still something I'm working with, but I use my usual method of some very highly diluted buff to me at paint and just slowly building that up until I was happy with the effect. And then just to improve the kit's exhaust stacks, I decided to drill those out as well. It's just one of those things that takes about 10 to 20 extra minutes to do and just makes your kit look that much better. Once they were drilled out, I just added some Tamiya light gray and then just painted some chipping on there with a brush just to kind of make them look worn and torn and then followed up with an enamel wash. That is going to be the conclusion of this video. However, I am going to let you know that I now have a Patreon account. So if you're interested in supporting the channel or seeing more of what's going on behind the scenes and putting a lot of more high def photos and things on there and engaging you more, Feel free to hop on over there and check it out. I have a couple of low tiers, uh, whatever you want to jump in as, whatever's comfortable for you. Every little bit helps, and it just helps me bring you better content. If that's not something you want to do, that's cool as well. Just make sure you're subscribed to this channel and click like, and make sure you've hit the bell button so you get notified of new videos. In closing, I am the Model Guy. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's definitely was one of my more challenging builds, but I hope I was a little more honest and upfront with it so you can see that we all struggle with model kits and it's not something through editing we can look perfect. These fine gentlemen here as well are some of the first supporters of the Patreon page, so check it out and join them if you'd like. I am the Model Guy and I will see you next time. I've also included the bonus photos of the hurricane I built for Peter as well because we initially thought that it may have been a hurricane that his great uncles killed flying. We decided to paint that aircraft as well because it would be something he would have flown at one point. The only difference here is I used the Mr. Color Azure on the bottom and a little bit more blue to it. Otherwise it's the same process, just a little more weathering, hopefully between the Tomahawk and the Spitfire. Hope you enjoy the photos and I'll see you next time.